we have a good story and that's what the people want to see when they go to your site. And I think we all do this when we go to look at a site, Patagonia or whatever, you want to hear the story. You want to hear there's real people there that are making good decisions, kind of decisions, right? And respecting other people and the environment on their way to make those decisions. So I think having the story to follow behind a product or an idea or a business, that's the key. If you're someone who refuses to go along to get along, if you question whether the status quo is good enough for you and your family, you want to leave this world better off than you found it, and you consider independence a sacred thing, you may be a prepper, a gardener, a homesteader, a survivalist, a farmer, a rancher, an environmentalist, or a rugged outdoorsman. This show is for those who choose the road less traveled, the road to self-reliance, for those living a daring adventure, life off the grid. In 1995, Corwin Bell started keeping bees due to a longtime fascination with this delicate pollinator. Along with Karen Sadenwater, Corwin founded BackyardHive.com in the spring of 2005. They are committed to bee-centric practices that increase the survivability of colonies. If the bees are cared for by applying the bee guardian methods that they teach, then the survival genetics and healthy behavioral traits will be preserved within the gene pool. Backyard Hive was the first to offer backyard beekeepers online resources, training DVDs, and information about getting started in a lifetime of top bar beekeeping. They realized the need early on and became the very first organization to make available fully assembled top bar hives on the web. BackyardHive.com is committed to sharing knowledge and top bar hive technologies that encourage and enable backyard beekeepers to be successful and completely chemical free. Corwin and Karen, welcome to the Off the Grid Biz Podcast. Hey, Brian. Hey, it's you. great having you here. Uh, why don't you let us know a little bit about what it is that you do? Well, we have a business called Backyard Hive, and it's about teaching natural beekeeping for people that are going to keep bees in their backyards. So we do classes, we do intensives, we innovate in the bee space, have two of our own designed hives that we've worked on over the years. And um, pretty much, you know, natural beekeeping is our thing uh, without using, you know, chemical treatments at all or smoke or sugar. So we really promote that. That's pretty much what Backyard Hive is doing. Yep. And we really want to teach people that method, you know, backyard beekeeping and natural beekeeping and treatment free. Well, that's fabulous. So you started the website in 2005, right? Yeah. Yep. And tell me about what led up to that. What was your life up to that point? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, yeah, it's funny because when someone says, oh, you're a beekeeper, I'm like, yeah, no, I'm a bee researcher more than anything. And even then it's odd that I'm doing bees. I started off in the film industry doing TV commercials. Then I moved into doing game design for computer games. I was the first one to put out a the computer game on CD-ROM for Hanna-Barbera called Page Master. It came out on the same weekend that The Lion King did, so it just it crushed our game on the end caps. Uh, but it was a great game. Um, then uh, I kept working in the game genre that we work in is called Serious Games. And Games for Health. And Games for Health. So they're games that aren't like driving cars and playing with little characters. So from that, we did um, The Journey to the Wild Divine, which was a big hit. The Dalai Lama played it, and it was had finger sensors that uh, read your biofeedback for real, and that's how you played the game. A lot of people call it Mist for Mystics, is what Wired <laughs> Magazine actually called it. And then um, we went on from there. So now we're overlapping. Now we're doing the Wild Divine Project, and here comes, you know, I'm like, oh, bees are cool. I want to do bees. And basically got a you know, went online. Back then it was like the modem kind of online, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and I found this guy, Marty Hardison, who did this thing called Top Bar because traditional beekeeping with the white boxes, the square white boxes, and they were all excited about having their chemicals in there and these frames and it was complicated. I'm like, I'm on 40 acres down and outside of Boulder and as a kid, I've been climbing trees up to beehives, thinking I'm going to stick my hand in there and maybe get honey or something. So I wasn't buying the idea that these bees were not dying and no one was treating them. They're up in a tree and they're doing fine. So I was looking for a simple method. 
meanwhile, I'm still doing computer animation on the side <laughs> and trying to knock these games out. But so then I built this hive from these plans that Marty Hardison had. It's, so a top bar hive is a long box and you put basically bare bars across the top and the bees look up and they go, oh, this looks like a good place to draw out one of our 100% natural combs, right? And so then they they do that. So that appealed to me. I built one hive and then, I don't know, word got out that I was Joe Beekeeper and I wasn't. And so I just got calls. Everyone was like, we have a swarm. Swarm is when the bees split and half of them go off, find a new home. And so I was getting all these swarm calls and I'm like, they're like, oh, yeah, can you get the swarm? I go, okay. And I go out and would catch the swarm and then I'd come home and be like up till two o'clock building another bee box. And so I built six beehives. So my big dive was like six beehives right out of the chute. <laughs> Paralleling that, we did the first CD-ROM. We put Newsweek on a DVD, okay, which is interactive, and that was a big deal. Mm-hmm. That got oh, no, that wasn't Newsweek. That was Oracle. They got written up in Newsweek. In my spare time, I'd go look at my bees and try to figure them out. And pretty much after about three or four years, I was just figuring it out because I didn't have a mentor and it was a totally new hive and the beekeepers were talking a different language and they didn't respect the kind of hive that I was doing. And I was like, okay, whatever. So I'll just be in my little bubble. And so pretty much I just learned everything about them through observation. And what I found was that I wanted to see what they were doing inside the hive. And so I uh, started putting windows in. So every hive became an uh, observation hive and I could, you could open the door of the thing and look in there. And it was like the ultimate ant farm. Yeah, then we put the website up 2005 because we had the German woodworker that was making these hives with windows. So we're the first ones to sell a fully assembled hive. We were the first ones to put observation windows in all the hives. So then we did a, a lot of um, pretty uh, well-respected and well-known computer games for uh, training doctors about patient safety, and that was all interactive stuff there. We were doing, uh, you know, big animation type stuff. Gosh, and then um, it was about, I think it was about um, six years that I just was working with the bees, and I started realizing that I probably knew a heck of a lot more than a lot of the beekeepers out there, because I just spent a lot of time observing them. Interestingly enough, when you understand the bees as a super organism, which they are, right, they're, it's not like a bunch of insects in a box. It's actually one being. And how they interact is amazing. There's not hierarchies. The queen's not leading the show. It's They all are like little computer programs that have little software installed in them. And that's how they all interact. And so you see all these emergent behaviors like you would see out of a computer game or say particle systems. <laughs> when you put a bunch of particles and give them rules, they all it starts to do something. You see these emerging behaviors. So then I realized that what was happening to the bees, because they were starting to collapse and have problems, was that the breeding of the bees, they were flattening the genetic pool. And they were basically breeding out all their computer programs that would keep them healthy and happy. And since I didn't do the traditional route where you go buy bees and like in the mail, I mean, it's kind of a weird thing, but you can get these kind of, I don't know, bees that are packages. Yeah, they call them packages. I was just catching swarms. So I was catching wild swarms out of the woods, you know, bringing them in and then everybody thought that I needed to be teaching them how to do this. So I had a bunch of little apprentices for a while um (laughs) let's see i got selected as a 2007 master artist in denver and so i did a big show and that all went out to burning man and so a lot of it has to do with i innovate in whatever space i just like innovation and so what i set out i was like i'm going to create the ultimate high but i'm gonna let the bees tell me show me how to build it what do they want And so I'd build these different shapes and these different passages and these different ways, and I'd give it to them for a year. Innovating in bee space is hard because you can't get it done and see what happens in a day. It's a whole year, (laughs) right? And I would just give them these different beehives and I would watch how they interacted with the nest space and how they're, it's called a nest technically for their brood and their, their whole thing that they build in a beehive. So then I came out with uh, the golden mean hive, which is all these golden mean ratios, which was amazing because they just somehow that ratio was just perfectly what they wanted. They wanted 40 liters 
of space and they wanted to have this certain proportion. So that the bees did really well on that. Everything out of window still. We were selling those pretty well um, online. So then I uh, worked towards uh, this one hive. I call it the Cathedral Hive. And it's fantastic. I mean, it's just a, an amazing hive. And what was cool is that it's kind of been adopted. In People, like there's a Langstroth hive, which is the white boxes. There's a Moore hive, which is a smaller kind of Langstroth type hive. And there's, a, you know, the old skeps, of course, that you see in the movies and pictures and stuff. <laughs> um, what happened is everyone started treating the cathedral hive as a hive type. Incidentally, they just didn't know they were when they got in like newbies that would come into the um, the bee world would go oh there's a cathedral hive and it's like well the cathedral hive isn't a type it is our cathedral hive <laughs> right so yeah I think that's pretty much how I got where I'm at now and then just expanded out the website and I kept innovating you know the bee space is so easy to innovate in because the technology for beekeepers is like hundred year old. Mm. There's just been no innovation because there's no money in beekeeping, right? Until everyone, all these people that had money wanted to have bees, right? And then the colony collapse thing hit. Mm. And I was the first one talking about it and saying what was going on. And people are saying, you're the expert. Tell me what the, I'm like, I'm not an expert. I don't think anyone can be an expert with bees. They're just too complex, right? <laughs> um, but, so yeah, I was kind of one of the forerunners in that, in that colony collapse thing that was going on. And, you know, it's kind of like the chemical companies trying to pitch, say it's the beekeepers management problems and the beekeepers are saying, well, it's pesticides and the chemicals and it's both commercial beekeeping and the way they do it. Since then, I've created this thing called a robber trap, um, which is robbing on, in beehives that are in people's yards is skyrocketing because everyone's getting beehives in their backyard. Okay. We did this thing called a cozy cover, which basically is this canvas duvet for a beehive and it wraps around like this jacket really tight because it was 2017 2018 between that and that winter that i started to see these massive drops in temperature so we did the whole spreadsheet went all the way back to 2006 in the front range and started graphing uh, 40 plus drop of temperatures seeing the increase of them because of climate change and that was knocking everybody out 2000 around here montana Kansas, there was this huge dip that came down and just wiped everybody out. And that was just a, a huge wake up call because, you know, being in that space, no one else knew it from the outside world going to King Supers and going shopping. No one knew what had happened behind the scenes, but it was heavy and it was big. And of course, the beekeepers came out of it because they just kept splitting their hives and stuff. But everyone was strapped on that. And so the cozy cover. It's actually uh, filled with wool, sheep's wool, and it's being studied at Cornell last year and again this year uh, with Thomas Seeley and um, Robin Radcliffe. They're finding out that the, a beehive with a cozy cover is looking like the inside of a tree over winter. It's buffering all these big drops and these, uh, you know, dives and sharp temperature fluctuations. So that's really exciting, you know. And I could go on about the innovations, but I mean, it's, it was just such a fun space to dive into and start innovating. Yeah. So that's pretty much where I think we got up to current now. Yeah. Well, that's fabulous. <laughs> so Karen, how do you play into all this? Started actually with the computer games with Corin. Um, He actually was one of my instructors for computer animation. Actually was an instructor for a while. And uh, that's where we met. And that's um, and I worked on the journey to Well Divine, that computer game for health. And as we were working, we're working on that and it was swarm season and I was kind of learning a little bit about bees because he was already doing bees. And I think the very first time we got the hive with Carlos was that, um, yeah, we were busy and it was swarm season, but I had caught a swarm and we're like, we don't have time to make the hive, you know? So we asked Carlos and he was able to whip one up and, and whatnot. And so we made, you know, that was the first kind of backyard hive. And then Corwin was like, well, let's put an observation window in the next one and this and that. And so just kept developing off that, you know, kind of initial thing and that kind of um, relationship with Carlos to get them made and then online. And then we had a friend that, you know, knew how to do websites and some marketing. And so we got it up there. And yeah, I was just kind of helping do all that and learning some at the same time. I knew a little bit about websites back then and know a lot more now. Well, it was funny too, is right at that time, 
we were like, everyone was like, well, how do you do this? And they were living in different places. And so they couldn't come to a class. Oh, yeah. So we made an uh, hour and a half DVD about bees, how to get started, how to do it and all this. And filmmakers and video editors, we kind of knocked it out of the park. Nice. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know? I was like, we didn't have to hire a team to do it. We just shot it all ourselves. And it's still selling out there. God, it's been selling for about 10 years. Wow. Now people go, you give them a DVD and say, hey, yeah, check out the bees. And they're like, I don't have a DVD player. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're streaming it. Yeah. Isn't that funny? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's fabulous. So if we took you back to the very beginning, when you guys first got the website out, 2005, mm-hmm. how did you get your first initial customers? How did the word get out from there? How, how were people finding you? Um, well, we had our friend Doug, and he was really good at doing some web marketing even back then. And so it was kind of new to us, for sure. And uh, he kind of, I think, got some keyword, keyword searches. That. that was pretty new. I mean, he was pretty on the yeah. edge of that. Getting some articles written up so we would all get together and he'd, he'd take notes. He would have this weird concept that when you wrote these articles, you had to have these words in it for some reason. <laughs> you know, I was like, why is it going to put it that right towards the top? And he did the keyword searches and you got to say, put the, put these in here. Like, well, why don't we just duplicate it? No, no, no. You don't duplicate pages and all these, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember I was in that field at that time too. So I, I know what that's all about. <laughs> That's great. So those initial people that were coming in, what were they seeing on your site? Did you have a hive available up for that time? Did you just have the training? What was available in the very beginning? We both. Yeah, we had the, the beehive and then we had the DVD yeah. and then a bunch of articles. You know, it's just right. like he would, we'd interview Corwin and he'd just say, you know, this is how I learned it. And this is what I did. And we just make articles out of all your content, you know, what you knew. Yeah. And those, and those articles kept driving traffic so anytime anyone googled something about bees we would be on the first page because we were really in that backyard high bee space before anybody else really got Mm -hmm. there there was a lot of low-hanging fruit that we just didn't have the time because this was just a side thing that we were doing you know we could have really hit that a little harder i think you know sure okay let's take a break from that conversation i wanted to bring up a question for you During these crazy times, do you feel like your business is indestructible? Most people don't. And if not, the real question is why? And what can you do to make it as indestructible as possible? Well, that's the basis of my new book, Nine Ways to Amazon Proof Your Business. I'm going to talk about the second way, which is called being consistent. I cover this all in chapter two. And I'm not talking about being consistent in a very generic way. I'm talking about specifically being consistent in your communications with your customers, not just customers you're looking to have, but customers you've already had and getting them to know, like, and trust you. Now you could be doing this through paid advertising, but you could also be doing it organically through social media, via videos, via blog posts, via podcasts like this, getting out there so that people can get to know, like, and trust you so that when they do become customers, they don't just become customers that enjoy and love your products or services. They know, like, and trust you as a person. That's a value they can't get from big companies. I also have eight other ways to Amazon proof your business. Basically the idea of making it competition proof to even someone as big as amazon.com. So if you'd like to get your hands on a free copy of my book, go to Amazon proof book Dot com. Sign up and you will get a free copy and get the chance to purchase a physical copy of it for a special price. And now let's get back to our show. Yeah. So how are new people finding you today? How are they coming across you? I mean, there's a lot of beekeeping sites out there, but we still try to keep ourselves kind of up there on the top. And just because we have some legacy articles and content mm-hmm. and whatever, it's, you know, really good for Google searches, you know, but we've taught classes now for since almost the beginning. Um, we teach classes, it's word of mouth. We, we've traveled, we've traveled internationally some. We went and we do conferences. We did like the first organic beekeeping conference down in Arizona, classes here, all over Colorado, California, Washington, I mean, on and on, East Coast, we've done some conferences and just keep the ball rolling. And we, you know, we definitely fine tune our website as much as we can and have time to, we don't always have, but we always just keep up with that. Yeah. And then, you know, put out an email blast all the time and get people information and 
you know, just keep people engaged. I, de I definitely think that um, the innovations are drawing yeah. big attention to us. That's true. Um, and the cathedral hive is, I mean, if you know top bars and you know the other to hive types, it's just fantastic to work with. You can tell that it's, the bees do really well in it. And the cathedral hive is now, you know, everyone's like, well, what's that? You know, and but we're really linking that and what we do to natural beekeeping. And so mm -hmm. a lot of people are now going, well, you know, we tried bees doing the bees this method and they keep dying. So maybe we're not doing something right. Let's see what these guys are doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, makes sense. That's, that's really cool. And who would you say is the ideal customer? Do you have an ideal customer or do you have, is it kind of go across the range from beginners to more advanced people that show up on your site and get the most out of it? Or what would you say about that? The ideal customer is women. They like gardening and maybe they have backyard chickens. Then uh, it's funny because a lot of people, you know, they want to do something for the environment. They want to do something for, you know, nature and the planet. And what can they do? It's an amazing thing that you can do to keep the pollinators healthy and happy. And mm -hmm. so we started this, um, you know, we coined the phrase a bee guardian. When I was started, everyone was like, oh, you're a beekeeper. And I'm like, I'm not a beekeeper because I don't smoke the bees. I don't put sugar in. I don't do all this stuff. So I'm, don't put me in that. And then the beekeepers tried to say, oh, you're a bee haver, right? Like kind of derogatory, mm -hmm. like, you know, oh, you're a hobby beekeeper. I'm like, no, dude, this is not a hobby. This is... We're talking about genetics. We're talking about <laughs> superorganisms. Uh, we're doing research projects. So that's why we coined the term bee guardian. So our ideal person out there wants to be a bee guardian and some that helps preserve and protect the genetics of the bees and from that angle. Yeah. And then once people get bees in their backyard, it's amazing. We just, because we hear, you know, everybody's story all the time. And it's like, they just have this huge awareness of what's, around them now. Now they know when the first plants come up and they recognize, yeah, oh, the dandelions are so good. And then they recognize, oh, this what's next in their yard and what their neighbor has. And then their neighbors get involved. So it really just expands this huge kind of growth and community just around somebody having the beehive in their backyard. Yeah. So then, and, and so what, if you look, kind of look at our internal mission statement, it's bringing meaning into people's lives. And the vehicle is the beehive and the mm. vehicle is healthy beehive. So when you see people's face light up when they get their bees, oh my gosh, it's so rewarding to see that. It just brings meaning and they can open up the windows and the kids can look in the beehive and they can see the honey being made and they can, the neighbors come over. And so it's really project-based learning for kids. Here's this, I mean, the bees you have to deal with, you know, weathers and temperatures and, and you know your biology and know your math and because the bees have gestation periods. So we go into a lot of elementary schools and set them as little citizen scientists trying to figure out why the bees might have died. And it's fantastic. And seeing those kids and I mean, you get a class of kids and they know more than the adults. <laughs> and you say, who knows what a drone is? They're like, ah, I know. <laughs> Yeah, so really, that's that's rewarding that we don't have scared kids running around because bees are going to sting them. Yeah. You know? <laughs> bees are cute. <laughs> that, that's great. That's really, really cool. And it's it's great when you're able to have, you know, from the outside, people see, okay, you've got a business, you've got a website. But when you're able to find the magic behind it, like you just described, mm -hmm. you know, bringing meaning into people's lives of the vehicle only being the bees and the beehive. That's fabulous. That's, it's important that everybody listening understand that there's magic behind every one of our, you know, we talk a lot about business on this show. It's a business. Yeah. But there's something deeper there. That's really cool that you've discovered and you could put it into words. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What would you say is the top seller that you're dealing with right now is it the cathedral hive or is it is it one of your training courses what is it the top one is definitely the cathedral hive then the cozy cover the cozy cover is just saving bees like crazy i mean people that is really the next step that people need to get those bees so they don't have to deal with those fluctuations and, and i've done a ton of research on that working with university of colorado here we're doing some temperature studies and insulation studies and then the courses are just i mean we pretty much have to cut them off, you know? <laughs> and so they, they definitely do that. And, and, you know, I still am doing these computer projects 
I just don't drop everything, go fly around the place everywhere. Yeah, we are just now just coming, you know, because of the COVID and everything coming up with online module based classes pretty soon. We hope by Christmas that we'll have those up and running. We're actually editing as once we get off. So, <laughs> oh, great. Well, yeah. and, and that brings up an, another good point. We're recording this re regardless of when you're listening to it. We're recording this in October, uh, late October of 2020. So we're still dealing with the effects of COVID-19 and everything surrounding that. How has that affected you and your business? When it first, you know, struck, um, everybody kind of went quiet. You know, all our online stuff kind of went beep disappear for about two weeks and that's like peak season for us you know mm. that's when everybody's getting geared up and getting ready for you know spring yeah so there was all of a sudden where it was just real quiet and lull and we're like uh oh maybe we should set up the vegetable stand <laughs> <laughs> you know and uh, then everyone just they just kept going they it, it's such a uh, powerful thing that people wanted to do wanted to do and they just it's not going to stop them and it's not that expensive to get into so pretty much, you know, now we got a little bit of the election lull. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and also this is our low season too, October. But leading into it, you did you see a bit of a rise like a lot of other people in this space just because people were at home and they're looking for things to do? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we do sell um, hive plans for our, our hives and we sell kits. Okay. So a lot of people are staying home. We also found out that the lumber yards that we get our wood from were just stripped. Everyone was home doing uh, right. home projects. Oh, yeah. You want to go get a, you know, a drill bit. And they're like, where are all the drill bits? Yeah. <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. It's an interesting uh, thing that you wouldn't normally think about, but it's true. I, I, think, I think we saw the same thing in this area. So touched on a little bit of this already, but as a whole, what do you like best about your business and your industry? Well, I mean, I'm not making something that's polluting. <laughs> that <laughs> makes me happy. And I'm helping others to help themselves and the environment. That's a big plus. You know, you don't get turned away at a potluck if you have a big hunk of comb. <laughs> you know, you bring another pan of quiche and everyone's like yeah you know we've got a lot of that going around right now but uh <laughs> so the honey is amazing it's interesting all the things that i mean honey was more than gold in several times in history it's weight and gold it was more precious so we're trying to bring more awareness to you know cheap honey is sugar water and Cairo syrup mixed with some honey mm -hmm. and so you're really you know it's kind of like good olive oil you've got to know the, the farmer you got to have be traceable otherwise you're getting a, a doctor i mean god what they're doing to honey is crazy the stuff you get at the stores yeah uh, chinese honey and all mm -hmm. this stuff that's nice so there's a lot of ways that i think that we're affecting society maybe in those kind of respects is like and bringing that awareness so that's i think that's we have a mouthpiece we have something to say in that mm -hmm. space, right? It gives us a, a way to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's fabulous. On the other hand, if you could change one thing about your business or your industry, what would it be? Get the beekeeping practices off of the sugar, get them away from the chemicals, um, getting farmers and to know that their spraying is affecting the pollinators, mm -hmm. not just the bees. I mean, it's crashing. All the other pollinators are crashing. And it's like no one's seeing it because it's not a managed livestock, if you will. Mm -hmm. Changing that industry, um, for sure. Like I said, bringing up the value of honey so that beekeepers don't have to take all these shortcuts. They should be able to go to the farmer's market and be getting as much money as a lawyer because it's you have to know a lot, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's definitely you know, bringing, bringing that awareness up. And then in terms of our own business what would we change? Is that doing, doing the bee guarding project and getting that kind of, you know, still really focus and focus more on more of the research and working with some of the universities. And so, yeah, we start, so we, we started the bee guardian project, which is the advocacy limb of backyard hive. And so that's doing, yeah, research studies, raising money to get more awareness to the kids. Mm. So doing a lot more kid projects, um, trying to get some, you know, funding in to continue innovating in this space. Um, I would say that thing that I could change, but I'm not sure quite how to change it, is just the supply. I mean, the supply, like we have 
a woodworker that makes the hives is one guy. Everyone thinks we're this mega business that, that have some warehouse somewhere. We have all these employees and it's not what's happening. We have several really hardworking and some, a couple of really awesome interns. That's a tough, you know, cause here you, it's coming up to Christmas and you need to have 40 hives built and ready to go. But, um, and we get a few calls now and then like, you know, you guys haven't returned my call today. I'm like, Oh gosh, if you saw how many calls we get, I mean, <laughs> and I, I got to finish this computer project, <laughs> you know? So yeah. Well, that's great. So if we were to talk with you say in a year from now, and we look back over the last year, the last 12 months, what would have had to have happened for you to feel happy with all the results in your business and your life? The key is that, you know, as we were, now we have a board uh, that's done the Beagarian project and they're all super sharp. And uh, you know, we have a branding lady that's done, she started a branding company, sold a branding company. She knows her stuff. We got a producer lady that I actually, well, two of the women on the board, I actually went to elementary school with in Boulder and I met them in first and second grade. So they're trustworthy. So when they looked into our little world of backyard hive from their outside vantage point, they're like, you know what, you got to do these modules because your audience is big, but you're not, you can't go to do 20, 30 people at a time on farms and expect to really uh, get the word out. So that was pretty exciting. And we have a lot of people that will fly in, you know, come in from Australia and they're like, are you going to be in Europe? And I'm like, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, so I, I would say that what needs to happen is we need to get these modules out there. Like I said, these people on the border saying, you know, you've been doing this so long, you have so much to say. And it's so unique, my perspective, because I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm not a beekeeper. I'm smart because I do computer game design. So I'm coming at it from that different angle. So I think that getting these these modules out and giving these uh, people a different way to approach beekeeping or being a bee guardian, that's so that's what I would hope to be saying in a year from now is that, yeah, we succeeded in, in getting that um, information out there in a nice, pretty way. Yeah. What are the obstacles standing in your way of getting there right now? That I have to build beehives every now and then, <laughs> too many. <laughs> and I'm not a, I guess I'm a woodworker now, but I'm not really a woodworker. And if we just get another bee, another uh, uh, woodworker on, then now you're kind of dealing with paying those guys, mm -hmm. right? We don't want to become a mega beekeeping supply house. That's not what we, I don't want to manage people, right? And that's not my skill base, nor do I mm -hmm. care to do that. People are kind of hard to manage. <laughs> <laughs> we keep it to really excited interns and people that are really, you know, who we like to manage. <laughs> yeah, having, you know, we call them like A students or even just anyone that comes on our team is someone that is really sharp. They're the top of their game. We're not going to go for the B, you know, eh, yeah, I kind of get this and, you know, and that's, and yeah. so being nimble in this space and being nimble as a small business that I think that's the key to it for us. Mm -hmm. That's a great point and a great, a great tip out there for all other business owners out there. Do you have any other blanket advice that you would like to give other people that like to build something like this or would like to take their companies to, to something like the level that you've been able to build uh, backyard hive to? The thing that I hear the most is someone says, oh, I got this idea. And then they built so many little businesses and so many little products and innovated, you know, in spaces. And you, it's like, first of all, you're making it for yourself because you want it and you want to see it and you want to play with it and you want it. It's got to be what you want mm. for you. So, so don't go out there and try and build something because you think that the horses are going to come and feed at your trough, right? You want to first make it for yourself and be happy and satisfied with the quality that you're doing there. I would say nimble team for sure. And don't get greedy and expand too fast. Also, you want to diversify, but you have to diversify very smart, very wisely. Because one little limb of a product, if you will, it starts to kind of get in shaky ground or something. You still have something else that will um, prop it up. So 
diversify, don't diversify too quick. Research what else is out there. If you have an idea about something, make sure, you know, look who else is doing it. Or is there, you know, what other companies, or is there somebody else out there doing and what are they doing? And a week, it. a week of looking around yeah. and going, am I just reinventing the wheel? Hmm. And then you have these other guys that are like, you're just drinking your own Kool-Aid. You're so convinced in your little world that what you have is the, your idea to build this business is so amazing. You got to look outside your box and mm -hmm. get feedback from your friends and your other Seriously. business people. Awesome. Corwin and Karen, that's great advice. And I really appreciate the time you spent with us. You got an incredible story behind you and of both where you've been and where you're going uh, with backyardhive.com. Is there anything that I haven't asked you that you'd like to answer? I think like you were saying just there on your outro was that we have a good story and that's what the people want to see when they go to your site. And I think we all do this when we go to look at a site and you know, Patagonia or whatever, you want to hear the story. You want to hear there's real people there that are making good decisions, kind of decisions, right? And respecting other people and the environment on their way to make those decisions. So I think having the story to, you know, follow behind a product or an idea or a business, I think that's, I think that's the key is having the real true story, not something made up and prefabricated, but something that you really are passionate about. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Let any listener know that wants to find out more about Backyard Hive. Yeah, backyardhive.com. And that's hive. It's not plural. It's just backyardhive.com. And there's tons of really good information on our site about starting a beehive or and the DVD is a really good thing to start with too is watching that. It's pretty inspiring. Yeah, sure. Yeah. People really enjoy it and they do get a lot of out of it. And it's something that you can just keep watching, you know, get it before the hive, then you get the hive and you go back and look at it and just, you know, you're able to rewatch it. And, and, you know, once you got beast and you go, oh yeah, that's what I need to be doing. And so, yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's great. Well, I can't wait to see where Backyard Hive and your Bee Guardian project and everything else is going in the future. So we'd love to have you back. But uh, Corwin and Karen, thanks for being on the Off the Grid Biz podcast. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Right. Appreciate it. It's great having Corwin and Karen on the show. I really like that there's so many different perspectives. I can go on and on about this conversation, but I'm just going to break down a couple of ideas that are coming to me right now. One is that you have this physical product, this beehive, these top bar beehives that Corwin was developing. They had a life of their own. They were selling plans for them, everything else, and putting that out there and letting people get a try on that. And then at the same time, they have the information side of the business where they're training people up on what these do and what the thought process is behind them and how to go about being a bee guardian, as he puts it. That brings a whole nother into it, but I'll get to into that in a second. First, the concept of having a physical product versus an informational product. And those are two different types of businesses, but they marry well together. So if you have an information-based business, sometimes having a physical product brings a whole nother dimension into the business. It, you'll see your customer base completely come alive in a different way when you introduce a physical product if you haven't had one up until then. At the same time, if you have only physical products, having informational products that back that up makes a huge difference and adds a whole nother revenue stream to what you're already doing. So that's really cool how he's been able to do that. Also being able to define themselves as bee guardians versus bee keepers or any of the other terms that he mentioned just completely standing out saying, we are not like everybody else. When you plant that flag in the ground and you put yourself above and beyond what everyone else is doing out there, not that you're saying you're better than everybody, but that you are just different. This is something different. You have to experience it. You have to listen to our story. You have to try what we're doing because it isn't like anything you've done before. This goes back to a principle that you hear people talk about a lot called the Blue Ocean Strategy. It was uh, based on a book 
And the idea is if you can make yourself so completely different than everybody else, then you have a completely blue ocean all to yourself. You're not in so much competition with other sharks for food that the waters become red with competition. It's a blue ocean. It's your own ocean. You define what it is. And by defining themselves that way allows them to stand out, which is really a cool thing. But also all the difficulties that he talked about that he's faced in his business, he can see that it, a lot of it comes back to not being too closed in in your own box and you know surrounding yourself with just what you want to hear. You have to get outside that box and have to talk to people outside the industry. You have to talk to customers. You have to talk to other people and really get other ideas in there. Because as business owners, as innovators, oftentimes we get stuck in, well, this is what I want to do. And this is what I think should happen. But we don't always take into account other people's opinions or other thoughts. And we kind of create our own echo chambers. And I like that advice that he was saying toward the end about really making sure that you look at it outside of your own dimensions. That's really a big difference. All in all, great conversation and really great uh, meeting Corwin and Karen and talking to them. Can't wait to see what they have uh, coming up in the future with BackyardHive.com. Join us again on the next Off the Grid Biz Podcast, brought to you by the team at BrianJPombo.com, helping successful but overworked entrepreneurs transform their companies into dream assets. That's B-R-I-A-N-J-P-O-M-B-O. Com. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on the Off The Grid Biz podcast, go to offthegridbiz.com slash contact. Those who appear on the show do not necessarily endorse my beliefs, suggestions, or advice, or any of the services provided by our sponsor. Our theme music is Cold Sun by Dell. Our executive producer and head researcher is Sean E. Douglas. I'm Brian Pombo, and until next time, I wish you peace, freedom, and success.